pleased to say we're joined now by the newly elected leader, Richard Brain. Uh, thanks very much for talking to us this evening and congratulations on your appointment. I believe you are the fifth UKIP leader to take the lead since Nigel Farage stood down. How are you going to change things for UKIP? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to unify the party. Uh, and don't forget that Brexit still hasn't been delivered. We're still waiting for it. The people voted for it nearly three years, uh, more than three years ago. And uh, it's time this government uh, actually delivered it. So we've got fingers crossed for October. But of course, don't forget that even if Boris Johnson does deliver it, the people that are trying to stop Brexit will continue. They'll keep on campaigning. And I've no doubt that they'll try to take us back into the European Union as soon as they can. So UKIP needs to stand up for what we have campaigned for for 27 years and make sure that it gets delivered. And what's more, make sure that it doesn't get undone by, uh, the, frankly, our Remainer Parliament that thinks it has the power to override the will of the British people. You have swung to the far right in recent days. Your predecessor, Gerard Batten, brought the party into disrepute. The NEC fell out with him. I believe, though, you were put forward for the position by him and promised to make him your deputy. Is that going to be the case? Uh, well, let me first say that UKIP is absolutely not far right. Uh, that's uh, a myth perpetuated by the press. It's, uh, frankly, an insult to working class people. As uh, an advisor, uh, weren't you? Uh, uh, and their concerns. So UKIP isn't far right. I, my view well, is. Well, you're using Tommy Robinson as an advisor recently. He's now in prison, of course. But people associate Tommy Robinson with the far right, don't they? Well, they may do, but you, Tommy Robinson has never been a UKIP member, and he's actually banned from joining UKIP. He could join the Tories or he could join Labour, but he can't join UKIP. So uh, it's quite wrong to say that he's uh, associated with UKIP in that sense. But don't forget that Tommy Robinson has brought attention to. Ah. We seem to have lost the connection there with Mr. Brain, the new leader of UKIP. Let's see if we can re-establish that connection. In the meantime, I'll bring... Tommy Robinson has brought attention to the, the British establishment's determination to cover up a vast number of crimes against vulnerable working class usually, but not just working class, but British people. Uh, and so they've got a lot to answer for. Uh, and so I think that that issue needs to be brought to light. Uh, and insofar as Tommy Robinson and many other people have brought it to light, uh, that's actually actually a good thing and we need to look very carefully at that. Uh, but as I said, Tommy Robinson is not in UKIP and uh, the press's obsession with him uh, is obviously is, is used as a way to smear us and try to make out that UKIP is far right. We're not. We're a far moderate party who believes in British independence uh, and we want to see it delivered for the sake of the British people who voted clearly for it. Where is the party realistically standing now? I mean, we've had a recent by-election and you were beaten by the uh, monster raving loony party. I mean, really, it's all over for UKIP, isn't it? Well, I don't think it is. UKIP, don't forget, uh, bumbled along on a percent or two of the vote for many years before, in 2010, starting to get some real traction. And then actually, in 2013, doing very well in locals and bringing about this, this wonderful referendum that has... Uh, you know, has lit up British politics. In fact, internationally, it's, it's made, uh, it's had a tremendous influence. So UKIP's been enormously successful and, um, that can happen again. Uh, so Brecon is a, a, a constituency where we've never really done very well. And if you look at the results back before 2015, you'll see that uh, that result was nothing unusual. Uh, so I don't think it signifies very much. And I think that UKIP can start to gain vote share again in the future by concentrating on our manifesto and our policies. Uh, and if people are allowed to hear about our policies instead of uh, the press just saying, oh, you're far right, which is, which is just a, a sort of slur, really. It doesn't mean anything at all anymore. Um, so I think if people are allowed to, I think people will start voting for us again. Um, and especially if Brexit isn't delivered, people will. But also don't forget that if Brexit is delivered, the Brexit party will, in some ways, become obsolete. But one thing that's for sure is that the people who want us to remain in the EU will now will then start to campaign to take us back in. And UKIP will still be there fighting for British independence, campaigning for British independence, and making sure that the fantastic referendum result of 2016 is actually honoured by our disgraceful establishment that's trying to stop it happening. But isn't that what the Brexit Party is doing? And effectively, they've replaced you, haven't they? Uh, well, I don't know about replacing us. They don't have a, a manifesto of, uh, you know, a broad range of policies as we have. And they don't have a 27-year track record of fighting for no. Brexit. They don't have members who can vote for candidates or for uh, their leader. So uh, the Brexit Party is really the fiefdom of one man uh, who decides yeah. who the candidates are. But they're and more popular than UKIP. 
well, for the time being they are, but I don't think that, uh, that, that will necessarily continue. I think that will change with time. Uh, you know, these things come and go. Meteor- don't forget that um, UKIP had a pretty meteoric rise in 2010 to 2015, uh, and I think that could easily happen again. Uh, because people know what UKIP stands for, because we are the party that told the truth about membership of the European Union and talk, actually said the unsayable things, uh, which is what we do. We talk about the things that people, the other parties don't dare to talk about. You owe Nigel Farage a debt, don't you? Absolutely. Sure. Nigel Farage has done a fantastic job over many, many years, 27 years. You just wish he'd shut up now. No, not at all. We want to see Brexit delivered by hook or by crook, and we don't mind really who does it. The main point is let's get Brexit actually delivered, real Brexit, not fake Brexit. The difficulty you've got, of course, is he's gone and set up with others the Brexit party, and they have stolen your raison d'etre, your principal raison d'etre. Um, I don't think that's right. We have um, a broad manifesto of policies and independence is in our party name uh, and we stand for British independence and we will do after Brexit is delivered. And don't forget that uh, Sir Nick Clegg and Gideon Osborne and all of these people will be still trying to take us back into the EU, uh, disastrously, of course. Uh, And so we're going to need to keep fighting that. It's going to go on for a long time. I estimated in 2016 that it would take us 10 years to really get clear of the EU. Uh, and I think, you know, that's a realistic prospect. So UKIP will go on fighting for British independence. And don't forget that uh, it's not just independence from the EU. There are other forces that we need to be independent from. We see already the growth of uh, international Marxism again. And uh, we've got the threat of Jeremy Corbyn with uh, the crazy ideas that didn't work in the 20th century and led to the deaths of 100 million okay. people at well, least. That, that's so a fairly we've distinct... got lots of independence to uh, aim for. A... You've become obsessive about... Islamophobia about the Islamification of the UK. Uh, reports in The Guardian suggest there's video showing you in Grantham and Lincolnshire talking about how we shouldn't allow the distribution of the Quran in public. Is that true? Um, don't forget that our law uh, actually bans incitement to violence. Uh, and so I think it's a very important issue that people look at why uh, the Manchester Arena attack, Lee Rigby, the 7-7 bombings, Westminster Bridge, London Bridge, and many, many other attacks. Assad Shah, for instance, in Glasgow. Would you sort uh, people handing out the Quran in Leicester Square? Would you outlaw that? Uh, uh, I, I think it, we need to look into whether it's actually illegal to do so, because we do have laws against incitement to violence, so we should look into that. I understand that there's something like a 100-year ban, a um, 100-year, sorry, threshold, uh, where if a, if a work is more than 100 years old, it isn't subject to uh, incitement laws. But I think that's worth looking at because there's no question that some people who commit violence are motivated by the scripture, Surah 839, yeah. Surah 47, verse 4, and the other many, probably 100 verses in the Quran that do encourage people to but, but, be violent but, but this, and even murderous. Um, I suppose uh, I should say congratulations. You, 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 the congratulations have included uh, a rather unconventional one from uh, George Osborne got me thinking what your friends call you because uh, <laughs> George Osborne has tweeted the new leader of UKIP is called Mr. Dick Brain. Really? Yes, well, uh, it's uh, not a new joke, let's be honest. Uh, and of course it's a cruel irony since I'm unexceptional in either organ. But uh, in fact, George Osborne didn't have the guts, as I understand it, to uh, stick with his own name. Uh, he, I think, was originally called Gideon uh, Osborne. But I don't know if he had trouble at school. Perhaps his, his parents were thinking of taking him out of school or something like that because of it. But um, some of us have to live with our names. Every man has his cross to bear. And uh, I live with mine with good humor. And I'm grateful that I'm able to provide uh, entertainment and enjoyment to people because of my name. Are you suggesting that you fear a sellout, a betrayal by Boris Johnson, and that you're not going anywhere uh, after the UK leaves the European Union? You're still going to be around? Well, yeah, I mean, the Tory party has behaved like um, a cheap uh, woman of ill repute. They faked, they tried to fake uh, uh, Brexit one under Theresa May with this withdrawal agreement, which was the most abject surrender. It was worse than what Japan signed at the end of the Second World War. And and we haven't been uh, bombed out and lost the war. So there's no reason we should have signed anything like that. So that was fake Tory Brexit one. And uh, I've I've long suspected that we're soon going to see fake Tory Brexit two as they concoct some other uh, uh, bogus Brexit and tell everybody, look, this is Brexit, and it, and very likely it won't be. So uh, I'm very nervous of that. What about uh, if we leave with no deal, which looks increasingly likely? 
Well, no deal, uh, I think it's the wrong name for it. We used to call it leaving the European Union. Then about a year after the referendum, uh, some clever people who are into neuro-linguistic programming decided, oh, this is a great phrase that we can use to describe uh, actually leaving the EU because it's negative and it makes people feel bad about it. So that's what they mean by no deal. They mean leaving the EU. Uh, and that's what we voted for in 2016. So I'm not scared of no deal at all. No deal means actually leaving. And I think it's going to be fantastic for this country if we do actually leave. And I'm sure that very soon after we really leave, we're going to start to see some economic benefits of doing so. This, this whole issue of Tommy Robinson is blown up in the, the media love it, of course, and it's all about uh, talking about one man. But in fact, he's done something important, along with many other people, which is... He's done some pretty unpleasant to things too, hasn't he? Which is, which is to draw attention to the fact that the establishment, the government in this country, told the police, according to Nazir Afzal, to turn a blind eye to the gang rape of, it turns out now, to be certainly tens of thousands of very vulnerable children. Okay, uh, so, so you're, you're, you're just peddling some Tommy Robinson propaganda there. I mean, it sounds to me as though you're going to continue down the same path as Mr. Batten and uh, continue to welcome Mr. Robinson with open arms and perhaps share a platform with him. Do you know who Nazir Afzal is? Uh, I've, I know the story you're referring to, yes, Mr. what Mr. Robinson okay. said, yes. No, it's, it's not about Robinson, it's about Nazir Yes, Afzal. I know, I know the story you're referring to, yes. Okay, he, he was the director of public prosecution. Yes, I uh, know, I know all this in the northwest of England. That's right, and he discovered that actually social services and police were uh, not only were turning a blind eye to this industrial scale rape of children. You see, a lot of people would say that you're peddling racist propaganda now. Uh, well, it's nothing to do with race. Um, well, uh, of course I, it race, is. Why? What, what race is it to do with? Well, you, did you, because the very fact that you're, you're, you're talking about these uh, prosecutions and so on, or the allegations, um, you see, it does seem to me, Mr. Brain, that you're, you are, uh, I mean, I know you, I think you were supported by Gerard Batten, so we're going to get more of the same from you, obviously, uh, as leader of UKIP, uh, as continue down the same path as Mr. Batten. You see, and I come back, surely uh, that's not going to, you're, you're going to come carry on coming sixth, uh, Mr. Farage and his party, uh, who have had nothing to do with Mr. Robinson, they're going to be the ones who are challenging the Labour Party and the Conservatives. You're becoming this a fringe party, aren't you? This, this isn't about Tommy Robinson. The press loves to talk about him. It's not about that. It's about the fact that Labour, under Gordon Brown, uh, actually instructed, as far as it, it seems from what Nazir Afzal has said, uh, police forces around the UK to turn a blind eye to a particular kind of crime because the perpetrators of those crimes were of a particular race or religion. Now, that is racist. So it's the government and the establishment that have well, been racist. You're Don't making you an allegation there. Well, it, it, you can uh, look Which I'm sure that ourselves. Gordon Brown and others would dispute. Uh, well, all, all I can say is look at the numbers. 84%, according to the Quilliam Foundation, of people uh, in prison for this kind of crime come from 3% of the population. So I'm not making an allegation. This is There is a record on this. And, of course, the, the press want this story to to go away. The okay. establishment wants this story to go let's, away. Let's because leave Tommy Robinson alone. Let me... What is your view of Mr. Robinson? Uh, I, I think he's done an extraordinarily courageous thing to bring attention to a vast number of crimes occurring in this country where the police were told apparently to look the wrong way, look the other way, uh, while these crimes uh, went ahead. Uh, and I think he's done a good and thing to so bring that to people's attention. So, so you condone breaking the law? Uh, well, in bringing attention to these um, rape gangs that were allowed to just carry on regardless, he, he wasn't breaking the law. Uh, when he went on Newsnight in 2011 to talk about this, uh, long, long before the Jay report, uh, he wasn't breaking the law. Subsequently, by filming people when he was ordered not to, he broke the law. You're not, you're, do you support that, do you? Uh, no, I didn't say that. No, but you, you supported what he's doing. So you don't support when he breaks the law? No, of course not. You seem to have trouble with the name of the London mayor. Uh, well, that's a story that's better. I made a spelling mistake, and um, <laughs> that's been turned into a, into a great big, uh, you know, story. I mean, I, I don't well, think it's... it's not it's really, is it? Because you... you, you I'm you sure your listeners have got better things to talk about, listen to, than, than, than discussion of spelling mistakes, you know. Well, I'll be the judge of that. Uh, the London mayor is, of course, Sadiq Khan, but you appear to support him on Twitter, Sadiq Khan, after one of the London bombers, after one of the uh, bombers responsible of course, to the London terror attack. And you say, apologies, I often confuse him with the leader of the 7-7 bombers. Well, I was talking about the spelling, obviously, because uh, Sadiq Khan and Sadiq Khan are quite easily confused. 
you're the leader of a political party and you can't tell the difference between an elected mayor and a terrorist. Uh, I was actually referring to the spelling. If you look at the context of that tweet, it's actually uh, referring to the spelling. So, I mean, that's why I think we're wasting the time of your listeners talking about a spelling no, error. I'll judge that, Mr. Brain. I'll, I'll, I'll judge that, thank you. How often do you confuse? I think your listeners should judge. Well, they yeah, probably yeah, are. Don't worry, I'm, pre- I'm prepared to run the risk. How okay. often do you confuse the two? Well, I, I don't know. The point, the point is that if well, you spell... Well, these are your words. Well, the I point is that when you write the word Sadiq and Sadiq, often uh, which are phonetically yeah, ident- more or less identical. So that's my final question. How often do you confuse? Because you're seeking to lead a political party in this country, and you, quote, often confuse the elected mayor of London with a terrorist. Am well, I asking how often you make this mistake? Well, for the third time, I'm going to say to you, uh, it's a, a spelling confusion, and I think it's a waste of time to go on about this. Can't we talk about more interesting things? No, I'm fascinated by how you get that wrong. Well, Sadiq and Sadiq are easy to confuse. But you get it wrong oftentimes. Well, it, it, I mean, it's not uncommon when you have two spellings of a name to have to think up which, uh, you know, when, before you write it, before you write it, you have to think, hang on, which way is it spelled this time? So this is never intentional. Sorry, say again? This is never intentional. What, a spelling mistake? Yeah, you, you don't uh, you never do it deliberately. Uh, mm, not, no, not really, no. Not I, really. I, try, I do my best to spell. Are, are we really, are you really... Uh, like grilling me on on my on my spelling. I mean, it's an extraordinary interview. No, I'm just interested. Can't we do better? I'm doing it because you're doing it deliberately. You're deliberately trying to link an elected official of, the, of London with a terrorist. Whether you do it deliberately to cause mischief. But that, that's your view. But I, I honestly think we've got more important things to talk about in this country. We've, we've got a lot of issues to deal with politically in this country, and this is a waste of time. No, no. I'm asking you, Mr. Brain. Do you do you do it deliberately? Sorry. Do I do what deliberately? Misspell words in general. No, uh, no. The first thing I want to talk about is hate. A lot of people are talking about hate. There's a lot of hate about it, actually. And uh, we've got a growing problem in this, my beloved country, our beloved country, the United Kingdom, uh, with extremism. Uh, it's a very serious issue. <coughs> and I'm not talking about the secret footage of uh, Islamic extremism preached uh, in some of some of our mosques. I'm not talking about the carnage on the streets of London, uh, Manchester and Glasgow. Uh, I'm referring to a more common form of extremism which has accelerated in the last three years uh, and I think it can be categorized as anti-British racism. Um, last night I was sworn at, shouted at so aggressively that I could feel his spit on my face and abused to the point that his friend, his girlfriend, had to restrain him by a young man called John, who works for the Daily Mail. He called me racist and he called me homophobe uh, without offering any reasons for that. I hadn't said anything to provoke that kind of uh, abusive attack. And. Um, his hatred was pouring out of his eyes at me. He was full of loathing. Uh, and uh, as usual, I remained entirely polite and civil. John, my abuser, is an example of a new extremism which is being fueled by a powerful establishment in this country. Sorry, remind me again. Well, I think I think they're being controlled by a a um, e, an EU federalist class. I mean, I would go so far as to say a traitor class. People who are conspiring with foreign powers against the people of this country. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and you know, if you look at, for instance, BBC Question Time <laughs> audiences, as not audiences, uh, uh, panelists the over the last uh, three years. You know, it's absolutely, I mean, statistically, it's way off the scale in terms of bias. You know, they hardly ever put real Leave supporters on that show. When they do, there might be one uh, against, you know, four other people. What will happen to the Brexit party? I don't know, he'll have to appoint someone. Uh, I don't know, maybe it will be Richard Tice or something like that. But essentially, I I can see it merging into the Tory party. Um, And I think that there are some people who are subscribers to the Brexit party who will rejoin the Tories. Um, I think 
probably quite a few will rejoin UKIP. Um, and some may go back to the Communist Party or wherever, wherever they came from. And when it comes in particular to the, the you see, there's an epistemological difference between the Bible and the Quran in the sense that the Bible is written, you know, the important books in the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, written by men. The Quran has a totally different status. It, it is held in Islam, as I understand it anyway, to be the Word of God. Uh, verse uh, Surah 6, 115, I think, says, No man can change this, the way, you know, change the Word of God. So it's, it's totally, it, I think it's a very different um, epistemological culture. We've got a wonderful journalist from the Guardian, <coughs> Guardian here. Uh, unlike the, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot their names, but unlike the mirror journalist sitting next to him, the Guardian, I think, as I understand, do you still have comments uh, below the line? Do you still run that? Uh, on some stories, not yeah. comments. And the BBC also chose which stories, and some of the newspapers, I think independent, uh, have more or less removed. Um, Essentially, they they found that people freely commenting on the newspaper articles on their online publications uh, is detrimental to their brand. And that actually wasn't the reason. It's just for legal reasons you have to be able to moderate all the comments. And there's so many more comments we literally cannot moderate them all. So we tend to have comments over on one story on each particular subject area. But that's the only reason. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I hope you all, all believe that answer. <laughs>